liking his posts. Okay, so uh, I'll just read a specific post from his uh, Facebook. You know, you know, among all the mark on Facebook, occasionally something impresses you, and you send a wow, right? So I'll just read one thing that uh, <coughs> post. and you decide who that reminds you of. Okay, for ten years on Sunday evenings, every boy in school was led out past the red brick, brick walls into the countryside for the walk. In fallow fields, scrub and thorn bush land, the literal landscape of red lakes, ponds and ponds, they played games, forest for dragonflies and caterpillars, caught catfish and frogs, and watched the sparrow hawk take a field mouse. Flat stones skimmed the white water, milk beet floated lazily by. Curiosity upturned stones, and scorpions scurried for cover. Baby yellow ones, black and blue adult scorpions, the occasional fiery red. I got to take my daughter out this evening for the Sunday walk, and we left the town behind. I showed her the nests of the baya, flocks of silverbill on pros prosopsis mesquite, and the bronze highlights of the drongo's wings. A field pipit rushed into the Parthenium patch, and a rat snake slithered swiftly and silently into the grass. We sat, by, we sat by a lake in the golden hour and watched the sandpiper and the stilt, the grief and the local goats, and I felt at home once more. Um, so, you know, this reminds us of Teddy and the walks to Narekaru and all that. So I'm just as excited as any of you to listen to Dr. Ben B. Samuel. When we were in the sixth or seventh, that's when we guys heard his name for the first time. He's the first guy to become a doctor from school. So that's, what, that's the story that was passed down to us. And after that, there was also Surendra from Steve's batch, who got a seat in the MBBS and then because of bullying and all that. So, uh, Benedict, Dr. Benedict's name is something that we guys listen to much later. And over tea, I was just talking to him and he told me something very interesting. Uh, it's, a, it's a coincidence, but the year he left, in March of 93, he left school. And that's when, uh, the June of that year is when some of us uh, from the batch of 2005, we stepped into school. So, with just as, in, uh, that's just as much expectation and interest as any of you, I'd like to invite Dr. Bendik for the first speech. Thank you, Josh, for this kind words. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I've been intending to uh, come to this alumni night for years since it started. Something or the other always comes up. <laughs> never been able to make it. And uh, Stephen called me suddenly out of the door weeks back. And uh, one, probably the most important reason I accepted this offer was because it was named after Edison Daniels. And uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to be a little pedantic at first and uh, take issue on your Excel spreadsheet which said the Edison Daniel lectures of life He'd be very upset with the preposition used. I corrected that. <laughs> so, uh, I'm, uh, I'll, okay, it's like, power. so I'll just say something academic first and then uh, go on to something more, uh, <clears throat> more general which will probably resonate with uh, most of you. But uh, whether we like it or not, when we grow up, we have role models. And we model ourselves on people we look, uh, we look at. All your life you may think that you don't like them, but you're constantly modeling yourself, your actions, your behavior, your attributes, uh, the way you speak, the way you behave on them. Okay? And uh, there is a formal term for this in psychology called identification. It's the process by which an individual assimilates in part of all the behavior, the mode, of expression um, and in general other attributes of another person. And uh, if I were to take a vote today on uh, who that person in Donovan would be, I'm sure Edison Daniels will win hands down. Okay, so we've, uh, most of us, and speaking for myself, and I didn't really realize this till I probably finished college and I started work, that. Uh, because we were away from home, usually it's the parents, for children who stay at home and study, it's usually the parents who, uh, who have a lot of influence on the way 
uh, children grow up. But for us, for most of us, and definitely for me, it was Mr. Edison Daniels, and I thought this, the first half of my lecture should uh, uh, talk about the ways in which he mentored me and how I apply that to my work today. And uh, I've taken about six or seven points which I use today in my daily life. Uh, whether, and again, whether we like it or not, people are going to start looking up at you. You are going to be mentors to other people. Whatever kind of position you are in, you will, there will be not just children, other people who work with you, who work under you, who will look up to you and they will take traits from you on how to get, get things done and uh, how to live their life. And these are the things that Mr. Edson Daniels passed on to me and I hope I'm, I will be able to pass on to people, <coughs> including my children. Okay, uh, Edson sir started teaching English in fifth grade and I can tell you for three, four years you would be in anticipation of your first English class with Edson sir. Okay, and uh, the kind of teaching he did when you joined fifth grade you don't expect to be taught the alphabet, but that's what he would do. You tell all of 10 years old, you go for your English class, he'll make each one of you stand up and say A, B, C, D. Okay, and he'll correct your pronunciation then and there. H. H. <laughs> um, that was the kind of... That was the kind of uh, commitment that he brought to teaching. Um, all of his classes, you were in rapt attention partially because he, uh, when you act, you it really hurt. But uh, but I also think that he had that kind of flair to keep a class of nine-year-olds together, uh, and uh, that is really difficult. I have a couple of children. Keep their attention for 40 minutes is quite a task. And uh, his, the second thing that I realized much later in life was that someone with uh, his ability has far more value in today's world than in the place where he's a. <clears throat> if uh, I were running a school, and she <laughs> was running a school, if, if I were running a school and I had to hire an English teacher, uh, the kind of money I'd be willing to pay for Mr. Edison Daniels would be, would uh, probably be one of the higher, would, would be, you know, I would literally pay anything to get in there. And uh, this man, he worked his entire life for, for very, very ordinary simple children, you know, and he's, he was committed to, uh, you know, teaching them something. He, he felt that he had something he could give them. And he felt it was worthwhile and valuable to do that and it was important to do that. And uh, that kind of commitment is uh, something that we can learn in our own lives and uh, pass it on to others. Uh, because we all individually have um, abilities that uh, <clears throat> we can share and all these abilities are valuable and the world puts a value on it. But you can share it uh, for a much better cause and that's one of the things that he uh, talk to Attention to detail, I don't know, I, I think some of you, Shimon and Simon and Stephen, do you remember this song, Dare to be a Daniel? And do you remember how many years it, it, it took us? Sir, would, I was just talking about his commitment. He, for every Sunday, he taught us one hymn and in the evening one chorus. And uh, this hymn, Dare to be a Daniel, I, if I'm not mistaken, it took him two and a half years to teach us this hymn and I've been trying to go through this music sheet and see which note he didn't like, okay? <laughs> so, uh, so, I think it is uh, honor than the faithful, after faithful is the word faithful because there, your, uh, the, the note drops by one note and we wouldn't sing it and he wouldn't take it. <laughs> so, what he would do is, so, you, know, you because faithful is one word, we sing it at the same note, but full is one note lower. And he, for two and a half years, he taught this hymn. Every Sunday he taught a new hymn, and when that was done, he would come back to dare to be a <laughs> We could get this, get this done. And, and it was very frustrating.
frustrating. <laughs> and it would be dead way. And he went on and on till he was happy that, you know, we'd actually got it. And uh, that's the kind of attention detail in my, in my line of work. Uh, it's attention detail is very important because uh, everything is fluid with time, okay? You see a patient, five minutes later it's not the same patient, okay? You really have to pay attention if you want to pick things up. And that was something that he really passed on to me and I try and... Uh, I am now on the faculty of my department and we have uh, about 15 trainees with us. So when... One of the things that I try to tell them and try to pass on to them is this thing, attention to detail and to absolutely get it right. Uh, and not take anything less than that. <coughs> Next thing is balance. Um, when uh, Sir had to be friendly, he'd be really friendly with you. He'd take you to his home on Sunday evenings for a chat. And then uh, when he wants to whack you, you will hear the cane through the air. <laughs> okay. But uh, that's not what I learned about discipline from him. The thing I learned about discipline from him was that uh, when he wanted to discipline you, it wouldn't be an emotional outburst. You would know way before it that this, <laughs> you are going to get it for this. Okay? So his rules were spelled out very clearly. And he dealt out discipline wholeheartedly without any emotion. Okay? And it was not linked to you as a person. He didn't make up his mind about you as a person based on what you had done. So when he had to thrash you, he will thrash you. When he had to be your friend, he will be your friend. Um, I don't know, I think Shim will talk about corporal punishment in its place in the world, but um, I've uh, <clears throat> tried to not use corporal punishment like kids. Sometimes it's very tough. Um, but uh, in those days, I think it was the norm. Um, and I think there's still a big debate about it. I don't think it's really settled. The debate on corporal punishment is settled. It is, it is banned, but I don't think the debate is settled. I think there are people who believe that it should have a place. But anyway, the thing is that he had this balance between being a buddy and a boss. And that is something that is so useful today as a... <clears throat> not only as a surgeon, but uh, as also a teacher. Skepticism. Okay. The man was an eternal skeptic. <laughs> uh, this is uh, something that we, this is one of the, our uh, clinical methods book had this on the first, on the page, before the forward page. From too much enthusiasm for what is new and too much con contempt for what is old, good Lord deliver us. Okay, you have to question everything but we're, uh, within reasonable limits. It's another thing that uh, Teddy, like uh, Stephen just said, he will not be easily impressed by anything. He will not be easily impressed. He is skeptical about even good things. <laughs> but uh, he will appreciate you if you do something well. And uh, I've had my share of Stephen's moments with him. And they stay with me, I'm not going to list them out, but they stay with me and he says you're good at this, you should do this. You know, he'll come up to you and tell you that to your face. And uh, that is uh, another lesson that uh, kind of, uh, I've, that is one outlook to life that I've imbibed. I question everything and I try and find an answer. We talked about nature. If you can find Elizabeth Colbert's book, The Sixth Extension, go through it. Uh, in the last hundred years, twenty to pardon, Colbert, Colbert. In the last hundred years, twenty to fifty percent of all the species in the world have gone extinct or are nearly extinct because of human activity. Okay. Um, how his? I know that uh, Terry's brother worked in biology. I think it was for a while at the Crocodile Farm in Chennai. I'm not, I'm not sure whether. Uh, whether he just trained there or he worked there. But uh, Teddy's basic degree is also in biology, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, zoology. And uh, zoology. Zoology. He, he made sure he passed that down to generations of people. He used to come for 
service to come for the morning prayer and sometimes the prayer will get five minutes over five minutes early that's 7 25 in the morning and then he'll walk back to his house which is near the ground and we'll be walking to the dining hall and he will take you with him down Francis's house what used to be Francis's house to his house at the end and he'll show you hoopos and uh, <clears throat> other birds brownie kites and a lot of birds would be foraging on the ground there in the morning as nobody used to be there and he'd do this quite ready. He just any random boy he'll pick up. He's picked me up a couple of times. Sometimes it'll be someone else. He'll call. He just walk them down and say, "Look at that." And on Sunday evenings, he'll actually show you things. Uh, sometimes people felt he exaggerated a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> I remember we went to Naraka on the way to Naraka. We found some dung and <laughs> he felt there were leopards around. But anyway, <laughs> uh, this is something I love. Uh, most of these photographs of mine, I try whenever I have time to go out to take pictures. And uh, it, it's something that I, I try to pass on to my children. And uh, it's something that uh, really resonates with all of us. Uh, <clears throat> Teddy taught us music, but it was not just music. Uh, I think we were children without cultural moorings. And uh, I agree with what Simon said that uh, the first few batches and Teddy, they contributed to the culture in that place. And Teddy in big part because uh, the fir my first memory of Edison sir is uh, teaching the Seekers hit Morning Town Right. I was five years old at that time. I loved that song. Um, and uh, it's not just the Seekers, but because you heard that music, you were going to go and find out no music like it. And uh, <clears throat> that the whole genre of folk music from that time uh, is uh, absolutely close to my soul. There are a lot of people I know from SV and a lot of other people who love it and I kind of love the people who love that kind of music. And uh, what we got was we were taken away from the culture of our parents but uh, we were moved in this different hybrid mixed culture which uh, I'm really proud of. Everywhere I've gone I've been able to contribute so much because of my cultural moorings. And a lot of us, lot of it is that legacy from uh, Mr. Edson Daniels. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you can hear that. He wouldn't just end the song, he had to end it with a flourish. <laughs> this is White Christmas. He wasn't happy playing C in the normal place, so he'd take it up the end of the stem, and then he'd play the bar D minor, and then he'd play A7, uh, sorry, he'd play the D7 like an A7, so up. He, he won't, he'll, uh, so that's what he will with the A7 uh, finger position, he'll move it up the stem and he'll play it there for that different sound. Uh, I was lucky to be a part of a band in college and uh, every time I did anything in music, Terry was always at the back of my mind. And uh, I absolutely adore him for that. And, uh, and I'm sure that all of you do too. <coughs> okay. I said a lot of things about him. I don't think anybody said this, but uh, uh, Shim, uh, sorry, Stephen, was it Stephen? You said that his room had a low window, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But one of the things you'd see on Saturday afternoons is a uh, guy in a vest and striped pajamas yeah. <laughs> kneeling down by his bed and praying. Okay, so he's playing Beatles for you, but he's praying there. And uh, I've, uh, because I, I transitioned from SV into a, a very different culture in Chennai a very materialistic culture in Chennai. And then I had to go and do uh, medicine with, in North India. And uh, then I, when I started my surgical residency, uh, it, it was really tough. It was really tough. And when things got really tough for me, 
the only thing that helped me was uh, to ask for help from the only person who provided. And uh, I never thought about this this way, but Edson sir to me was the guy who introduced me to the secular world. But he's also the only guy in SV I saw praying who I was interested with. And that has really stayed with me. <clears throat> and I can't get this image out of my mind. So he'd be wearing his white uh, vest like the one I'm wearing now. <laughs> okay, with the, all this, uh, everything else showing. And <laughs> striped pajamas. And he'd be that yeah. small uh, that cot there. Yeah, he'd, he'd be kneeling down by that and he'd be praying. And his state cot actually would be on the window. Yeah and playing music to the, so you'd be listening to Simon Garfunkel or John Denver, but he'd be playing behind that. It's uh, something that I'll never forget in my life and it's been really used to me. And these are the things that I use in my life and I try and pass it on to the people I work with, the people who, the, 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 my trainees and other people. <clears throat> so I want to raise a toast of gratitude to the man who taught me to say cabbage village and vehicle. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> Off it down like locking work. Um, I really thank God and I thank Stephen uh, for this opportunity to come and talk to you guys. If this was not titled the Essen Daniel Fletcher, I wouldn't be here. And, uh, I just want to say a few things about my work. Um, I work in the Department of Urology and we deal with diseases of the NITO urinary system. <laughs> Uh, we just celebrated, uh, department celebrated 50 years, it was the first teaching department in the country and I work at this uh, place, CNC Valor, it's about 400 kilometers from here, an 8 hour drive from... Uh, it's a historical place, the first mutiny took place here in 1806, there's a lot of architecture from the Vijayanagara time, uh, there's a golden temple that people go there, I don't know for what, but... <laughs> We are a 2,800 bed teaching hospital established in 1900 by uh, Ida Scudder, an English missionary. Uh, seven generations of her family had been missionaries in India and Sri Lanka. So she was practically an Indian even though she was an American. Uh, we consistently ranked in the top two or three medical colleges in the country. Uh, about my department, my department is known for pioneering brain transplantation in India in 1971. We did the first successful transplant. We do about 100 to 120 transplants a year. Uh, we have three units, six professors, 15 trainee urologists, 14 consultants, and uh, five technician trainees. We see about 63,000 patients a year, just in my department. Uh, we have about 3,600 inpatient admissions. We do 480 AK procedures and about 3,500 major operations a year. And uh, last year we did 111 brain transplants. Okay, anyway, uh, the only reason I wanted to say this is that if any, if any of you need any uh, if any of you, need, I hope none of you need to come there, but <laughs> if any of you need to come there, you can let me know and I'll try and help you. The logistics, it's a little difficult getting through the hospital system because of the crowds and everything involved. Uh, they kind of streamlined it nowadays. You don't have to, uh, what patients used to do was to come and wait in well for two months just to see the doctor and it's really terrible. So we have an online appointment system right now. So you can book your appointment and you can come and it's time for you and you want to come and stop <laughs> uh, We do high-end work. Uh, practically all the treatments available in the world are usually available there. Uh, but uh, also we've tried to keep that spirit of sharing. A lot of people ask me if there's free treatment available there. Uh, free treatment, the hospital was established for the people around Bello. And uh, so our formal uh, concessions are given to anybody living in North Akbar district or Chitur or Tirunamalai who can literally walk into the hospital without anything to get it from them. Everybody else is expected to pay. So, uh, we can work from there if someone really needs. It's working okay. So, uh, if any of you need any help, just a couple of things since Edith is here, I really don't remember. Uh, wait, I don't know which batch you are from, but. 2009. 2009, okay. A uh, couple of things about the school, I was just telling Stephen that um, <clears throat> in the next 15 years, the uh, 10 to 15 years, uh, most probably Conrad sir and all that generation of people will have to move on. And uh, the long term viability of the institution will depend on uh, what kind of support it gives them. Definitely the institutions need to grow with time, otherwise they become irrelevant. And uh, 
one of the things that I've always thought about was the, the reason SP was established was to provide education for missionary kids. And unless missions are invested in the school, you will find it difficult to sustain that. You have to get all Indian missions to be invested in the school, whether they serve on the board. They have to have a reason to support the school. And they should support the school. They should be the primary people who support the school, wherever else your help, help comes from. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing about missions is that missions is a wide network. The wider your network is, it's the easier it is to get help for the school. So uh, you have all kinds of different missions all over the country. You should look into that. Please tell for that, sir. You should look into getting missions involved in running the school. There may be issues. CMC Velo has a very nice model. Uh, CMC is run by a board from all, of all the churches in India. But the churches cannot interfere in the running of CMC. And you have to have that. Okay, so you have people who support the place, but they don't interfere with the running. And that is very important to maintain this differentiation. I wish I could come and talk sometime to Sir about this. It's a very nice model. It's one of the reasons that CMC, a lot of mission hospitals in India have shut down because they've uh, not been able to keep, keep up with the change in the country in general. But CMC is still one of the best hospitals in the country. It's because of this, that while it has the support of the wider community, that community does not interfere with the administrative running of the school. And if you can take that back and work on it somehow, if the alumni can help in some way, talk to our own mission boards, I think that would be a great thing. And that's just one thing I wanted to leave with you. Thank you so much, Stephen, for this opportunity. It's great to see you all. I was uh, quite happy to see the and other people who I've uh, always looked up to. And thank you very much again. Thank you very much. I've never seen an adult wear a pajamas religiously on Sundays, other than our dear Mr. Edson Daniels. So, thank you very much, uh, Benedict, for uh, bringing those memories alive. And, uh, you know, <coughs> it was just like uh, Mr. Edson would speak, you know. <laughs> so, when I read your post on Facebook, I, I told the guys, Dude, this is, you know, this is what Edison says, last five minutes, you know, will sound like at school. So, thank you very much. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, taking time to talk about your work and uh, your experiences uh, and your uh, what you've drawn from Mr. Edison. Thank you. Uh, now we're coming to the close of our program. Wow. Wow. Joy or feedback? Joy or Joy or Yeah, so uh, there is a link to the feedback uh, form that Jasper is sending out on the Uti uh, group. So uh, please take time to give feedback. This will go into uh, how we uh, structure the next program, the next meet, okay? So please take time to do that. And uh, uh, after this, uh, we'll uh, have lunch and then break for uh, our, uh, you know, vans, okay? So we'll close after this, after lunch, okay? Before lunch, uh, we'll sing God Be With You Till We Meet Again, as well as our school song, okay? So school song, then God Be With You Till We Meet Again, and then break for lunch, okay? And before that, I just wanted to uh, thank all of you. So. Uh, there was an uh, article in our uh, website that said, standing on the shoulders of giants, you know, Joshua Menel had written, he talked about Ivan Bala Singh and the others who founded the school, the uh, founding fathers of the school and how today we stand on their shoulders and he uh, used a popular phrase, standing on the shoulders of giants. I believe we are among giants today. We are standing with giants as well. Uh, so, some of the people who worked for this program are giants in their own right. And I'd like to uh, imagine, I'd like, you to, I'd like to take you back to school for that trip from the kitchen to the boys' hostel on the bandy. Okay? Uh, 
instead of uh, the, the vessels in the bandy, I want you to imagine children and kids and boys and girls on that bandy. And you know, we're going for that ride. And I don't know how many of you remember Bandakat, you know? Uh, when you're coming fast, you make that sharp turn and it's called Bandakat. <laughs> You didn't have that. The word okay, you didn't use the word bandakat, but you must have used something else. But in my time, banda was you know you know word that we used as you know show off. So uh, so bandakat was you know uh, the driver used to do that. And you know there was there were so many people. Uh, so the driver used to be on the middle. Uh, so he was uh, sort of the leader of the group. And then there were guys on the right. There were guys on the left. And yeah, holding it, holding the lids down. You know, uh, that's legend that you know uh, somebody went to the uh, vessel, but you know, <laughs> and the kurma tasted so. <laughs> but you know, there were people uh, holding uh, on the sides, uh, and sometimes you know the front wheels used to get caught in the sand, and somebody has to go and uh, you know uh, make it all right. You know, so there were many people involved. Uh, there was a leader, there was a driver, there was people on the right, people on the left, <coughs> and there was, a, there, was, there was somebody to uh, take off the wheels at the front when it got stuck, and uh, there was a navigator as well, you know, uh, sometimes the wheels on one side used to lift and used to go like how Paul drives, drives his car, <laughs> but, <coughs> you know, so there were so many people in, involved in it. And the ride was, you know, ride would have been so very jolly, you know, it's a jolly ride. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, without the people inside it, it wouldn't be fun. You know, it would be just uh, a chore uh, for us, uh, bringing the one But when there were people on it, you know, there was that extra enthusiasm and that thing to take it, you know, forward with speed. And, uh, you know, uh, it used to run over that uh, small stones and uh, you know uh, I, I just can picture that you know when you're going when you're running when you're pushing with so much of spirit uh, and that you know with people inside enjoying that 